Matt, you as the chair quantum safe cryptography and security uh, at Etsy. Um, and uh, he's also the senior principal engineer at Amazon Web Services. And today in this presentation, um, he will talk about the post-quantum cryptography at the European Telecommunication Standards Organization, ATSI, in Europe. Welcome, Matthew, and uh, thanks for, for being here. Thank you. So, uh, Matt Campagna, um, this is on, all right? Okay. Uh, from Amazon Web Services. And I have a... A short outline I'll go through, um, sort of a brief history of the Etsy uh, TC Cyber Working Group on Quantum Safe Crypto, some basic information about the working group, um, a little higher, thank you. Uh, the work that we've done so far, which are largely technical recommendations, so not normative standards, uh, but one normative standard, and I'll go into that one in a little detail and its purpose as well as the current work items and how they relate to some of the things that we heard here so far today. And then finally, how to participate within Etsy uh, um, uh, if you're an Etsy member. Um, and, and then go through a little bit of uh, how that, my role at, at Amazon Web Services uh, along the migration path for PQ and why we're participating in these various forums. <coughs> So first, uh, Etsy, for people who aren't familiar, is the European Telecommunications Standards Institute. Uh, there are regionalized standards bodies focused on um, information technology systems. There's 29 technical committees, and they can produce what, what are called uh, normative standards, TS and, and European standards. There are 17 uh, industry specification groups. They typically produce technical recommendations and then two open source groups that are focused on producing open source software. Uh, it has a special role within Europe, so to produce harmonized European standards, there's three organizations that can do that, CEN, CENELEC, and ETSI, and this is usually for the purpose of European Committee, or, yeah, the European Committee uh, EU uh, regulations. So typically that work comes in as a request from uh, the EC or the European Trade Association. It's funded uh, by its members. Uh, so the people who are building products are, are the people that are really directing the work within Etsy. Uh, and then, as I said, it's also funded uh, by the European Commission and um, European Free Trade Association. And the current director general is Luis Jorge Romero. And it's located in, in Sofia and Tipolis which is, happens to be in the south of France. I don't advertise that at, at, at work. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit of the history of the working group on quantum safe crypto. It really started as uh, the output of the first Etsy and Institute for Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo's quantum safe cryptography workshop. Uh, and that was held in 2013, and that brought together uh, members of industry, members from academia, the research community, and, and, and various governments like NIST, and I think CSC was there, uh, to really change the conversation to, uh, from post-quantum crypto to, hey, you know, we know from our transition from integer-based factorization cryptography to elliptic curve cryptography that it takes 20, 25 years to go from design, analysis, standardization, robust implementation to wide-scale deployment. And if we didn't start you know, now, then, then we were going to be behind the curve for a large-scale quantum computer. Um, in 2015, we published an actual security paper as an output of that workshop. It took a little while. Uh, there was a lot of interest in it, but we published that. That's publicly available today. Uh, and that really kicked off the work that's being done in, in the, uh, what started as an industry specification group for quantum safe crypto. Uh, and that moved as we decided to produce technical standards as well as technical recommendations to uh, a subgroup of TC Cyber because that is uh, capable of producing standards. The meetings are coordinated with TC Cyber, so if you participate in TC Cyber, it's one of the days uh, during the Cyber Week, and we have a lot of members that participate in, in both sessions. So uh, as I was introduced, I'm the chair, 
from Amazon. Uh, we have our vice chair here, Philip LaFrance, uh, uh, from ICERA, uh, uh, another vice chair from NCSC, Dan Grundy, and our secretary, Tony Barnett, from TALIS. And then all of the technical groups, um, you know, ISGs or technical committees, have a Etsy uh, uh, officer for, for facilitation and making sure that we're complying with the various uh, rules of developments, developing standards. We have a fairly healthy participation, 30 to 40 registered uh, participants at our last meeting. Well, I think we were 30 to 40 on average between them. Uh, I should get the exact number for our last one. We just held our, a meeting in February along with uh, the last Quantum Safe Crypto Workshop in Sofia and Tipolis two weeks ago. So here's a list of the, the TRs we've, we've completed so far. Um, and the first ones were, were largely surveys. Um, well, the first set listed here, they're not in chronological order. The first one sort of predated the round one submissions from NIST uh, that were published from NIST. It was really a survey paper of the technologies for quantum safe key exchange. And then we did revisions essentially of those focused uh, on the round three submissions uh, for the quantum safe uh, chems and, and quantum safe signatures. Uh, we produced a, a technical recommendation that came up about VPNs, looking at various VPN technology, including IPsec, SSH, TLS, and MACSec. And what, what are the, the, the post-quantum uh, migration sort of needs of those technologies? Uh, we've uh, explored, we had a technical recommendation on using uh, lattice-based crypto for identity-based encryption, uh, produced a technical recommendation on the migration strategies for quantum safe schemes, uh, and uh, a TR on additional uh, considerations for managing state for stateful authentication mechanisms. So beyond what's specified in NIST SP 800-208, there are some additional um, uh, recommendations for managing state. And if you have any questions, you can corner Philip, because he, he was the editor of that one. And then we also produce one technical specification. Uh, as I said, you know, the, the work that's being done in this work, working body or this working group is based on the needs of its participants. And one of those needs was uh, being able to begin the migration testing for post-quantum crypto. And in particular, deploying hybrid in a way that, that ensures you're not losing the guarantees of the classical scheme that you're using. And in order to do that, it's nice to have a specification and associated security proofs on that specification. So I'll go through the two sort of schemes that are in that. Uh, it's got a concatenate hybrid key exchange as well as a cascade uh, key exchange. The way the concatenate key exchange work uh, is done, it's a little bit abstracted, um, but you have first generate sort of Alice will generate essentially an elliptic curve key pair represented by the first generate D and P, uh, and will also generate uh, a, a chem key pair represented by the secret key and R, and form a first message and send that across to Bob. Uh, Bob will generate an another elliptic curve key pair K and Q, uh, do the encapsulation mechanism to get a shared secret and a ciphertext, form a second message B from Bob and send that back to Alice. Now Alice can do the decapsulation. Uh, both of them can complete the Diffie-Hellman, concatenate those two secrets, and run a KDF over that secret along with the concatenation of the, the two messages. So it's a little bit stylized compared to what's in the spec, uh, but, but that was the goal. And then you have a key that you can use for the, the authentic, uh, an encrypted channel. So it doesn't deal with authentication. It's really focused on just how do you do the hybrid key exchange. There's a second technique in there called hybrid key exchange. Again, Alice would start that, generate an elliptic curve key pair, put it into a first message and send it off to Bob. Bob would do the analogous other half of that elliptic curve key exchange produce a, a second message with that public key. And that would allow Alice um, to, to, well, we have a chaining secret in this particular case. It's kind of uh, um, uh, based on, Scott Floor uh, did a lot of this work based on what's in Ike V2. 
Um, so you'd run sort of a PRF over the chaining secret, which might have zero or it could be a pre-shared key, um, depending on your configuration. The, the elliptic curve agreed key, and then the message go through uh, a PRF, and then you throw that through uh, a KDF to get a new chaining secret, a new key for a first sort of tunnel. Um, and in that tunnel, you could execute a second key establishment mechanism, presumably uh, um, a, a post-quantum chem. Again, you generate, Alice would kick that off, but generate the secret key, create a first message, send that across, and, and Bob would do the encapsulation, form a second message, and send that message back to Alice. Alice would do the decap, and again, they'd do the same PRF with the chaining secret from, from after the execution of the first one along with the shared secret and the messages uh, and create a new key to get a second encrypted tunnel. And maybe you do one tunnel at the end, maybe you run a tunnel inside a tunnel. Uh, the, the spec doesn't uh, um, force you to make that decision. Um, and again, the, the, these are designed to have indistinguishability against chosen plain text attacks. Uh, so, you know, attend it for ephemeral use cases like key establishment and it's really so that you can begin testing how um, post-quantum schemes are going to work in your environment. Because a lot of the things we do are covered by IETF, but when you're running a, a large uh, infrastructure, you have a lot of bespoke engineering. You need to begin testing to see, uh, can you do a drop-in replacement with post-quantum, or do you need to re-architect? Because those are definitely different orders of magnitude of work. So we have a, a, a list of current work items. Uh, we're just finishing up a technical recommendation for the intelligent transport system uh, for QSC migration. And again, uh, I think it came up earlier, the vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure. Those are very bandwidth constrained environments. Uh, it has a fairly complex PKI uh, associated with it. And just looking at how are you going to migrate that, highlighting where you might need to make architectural changes or pro significant protocol changes to make that work. So that should publish relatively soon. Um, we have a deployment considerations for hybrid schemes, diving into that question of, hey, if, if, you're, if you have a composite cert where one cert is uh, attached to a second cert and you decide to re revoke that first cert, how should you handle uh, revoking that, the, the related cert. So that work is undergoing. That's in the very early stages uh, and, and is being developed currently. Uh, we're in the process of updating that uh, quantum safe hybrid key exchange specification, looking at providing uh, indistinguishability against chosen ciphertext attacks. So kind of like the PGP uh, um, you know, email situation, trying to have a solution that can be used for beginning that testing and migration. Um, and then we have two other uh, technical recommendations we're working on. One is looking at the, um, the impact of quantum computing to the, the, the number of sort of security proofs, assumptions we make in building uh, security proofs from our schemes. We also have that editor here, Gabriel is, uh, Spini is here, and he can dive into that if you have questions. Um, and finally, we're looking at the impact of quantum computing on symmetric cryptography. And in particular, really just looking at, you know, a refinement of, of you know, block ciphers and, and keyed hash and what kind of assumptions uh, can we make about how long uh, can we trust maybe AES-128? Like, is the assumption that we must go to AES-256 uh, valid uh, and, you know, what kind of timelines should we recommend for that migration? So it's a little more technical, in-depth look at that. Again, that one is also in its very early stages. Some of the things that you know keep me up at night, there it is. I, I realize that there's a delay between this. And, so sorry if I'm speaking on slides that aren't up. Uh, but one of the um, partnerships that Etsy's involved in is 3GPP. Uh, that, that, of course, is the 3G, 4G, 5G standards. And it's a complex set of standards. When you mind map out, in the middle of this is Etsy TS-133-501, which is essentially the 5G security 
uh, uh, document. Uh, and you can see that, you know, everything in orange is, is requiring some public key crypto to, for the security of that system or 128-bit security. And you have to, uh, you know, track down all those boxes and make sure you're developing uh, a solution for all of those. Um, so I won't go into all those standards, um, and, and it's not by any means complete. There's probably a lot of favorites up there. Uh, but when you scope out and you say, well, what, which ones are people working on? Um, there's a working group called Etsy Sage, Security Algorithm Group Experts. Uh, it's been spending uh, the last couple of years migrating all the underlying ciphers for uh, 5G uh, authentication and, and, and communication encryption to 256-bit ciphers. So worked on Snow 3G, Zoop 256, as well as updating the Millenage key establishment to AES 256. Um, there's certainly work, as, as Mike indicated, going on within IPsec for IKE-B2, uh, as well as work in IETF on new RFCs for PQ TLS 1.2. I think that one's dropped, uh, and 1.3 is still is still active. And you can see all these boxes that are just white uh, dots that I don't know what's going on there. That doesn't mean nothing's going on there, but, but I'm not aware of uh, or I'm not tracking. Uh, and, and this is the type of, you know, the other technical committees within uh, Etsy are, are going to be looking towards the Quantum Safe Crypto Working Group to help them decide within their standards, within their mind maps, of, of their standards dependency. How are they going to be able to move that? And we'll be providing guidance on, on how to do that. So how do you join and participate and, and, and come to these meetings? Well, if you're an Etsy member, uh, you'll appreciate this 1990s, late 1990s style web portal. Uh, I'm sure you all have standards web portals that you love and hate, and they, they, they manage to work just fine. And, um, I'm amazed that it does, uh, especially when you're submitting contributions. Uh, but you can find us there at the member portal under the cyber working groups, uh, and you can go through our documents there. One of the nice things about Etsy is the documents are worked on in, in committee, and they're kept private to the Etsy membership. But, but when they're public, they're public. They're, they're freely available. There's no paywall. They're just available for, for anybody to download and use. Um, again, how to participate. Well, May is an awfully nice month to come to the south of France. Uh, I did notice that the, the, the Grand Prix in Monaco, Formula One, is that weekend. Uh, I, I may stay a little longer. Um, September is also a nice month. Uh, but February and December, uh, um, it's also a bit of a break. There's not much snow there. So um, what I was going to talk a little bit about is how does that fit into essentially, you know, what, what I'm doing at Amazon and how Amazon plans to sort of transition to, to post-quantum cryptography. So I'm part of an org called AWS Cryptography. Uh, we have a number of publicly facing services, uh, Cloud HSM, which is essentially how do you get an HSM which in, within your virtual private cloud environment, um, our key management service which is sort of how do I get keys that I can write policies, like AWS policies, around its use, ensure that those keys are confined to a FIPS 140-3 HSM, and be able to encrypt all my data or secure my data in all our services, as well as API programmatic access to that, to that, pub, to that key. And then Secrets Manager is kind of one level down. If I have programmatic needs for a secret uh, that'll be encrypted to a KMS key that you can just access that for your applications. We run uh, a web, web trust audited certificate authority, AWS certificate manager, as well as private CA uh, uh, services for, for our customers. And then a code signing service that's doing application and firmware signing. Uh, in addition to that, we have, uh, we're building a lot of our own tools. KMS is basically a key management service. It's good at giving you keys. It'll encrypt small amounts of data, but if you have a large amount of data, then you, know, uh, you need a way to encrypt it. And the encryption SDK is what we're using both internally 
and vending to our customers to encrypt their data. Uh, we're building our own lib crypto library, AWS LC. It's a, it's a fork of boring SSL, uh, and we're sort of we we require our own sort of static stability of those APIs. So we've taken our own uh, dependencies on that, and we're running that through uh, FIPS, and we're going to continuously keep that FIPS validated. And then we have our own TLS stacks. Um, so Open SSL. Uh, S2N is the, the, the name of the software. It's a TLS and quick protocol. Um, and internally, anything else that we build uh, that doesn't use these services has to go through sort of our crypto bar raiser, which is making sure that somebody's doing the design and analysis of that cryptography uh, and managing our post-quantum crypto migration. And then we're looking at cryptographic computing. We, we're, we're beginning to vend uh, applications within AWS that are, so that you can keep your data encrypted end to end and still do some level of computation over it. So the first application there is Clean Room, uh, which is designed to do things like joins, inner joins between different customers uh, that might want to share information but only what's in the intersection. So the problem I worry most about is I think all our customers, if most of our customers, nearly 100%, are transmitting their data over some network, whether it's the internet or a direct connect link uh, that is a network that we don't fully control. Uh, and we're using public key protocols, largely from the IETF, some MACSEC, to get that data into AWS. And of course, there's the record and harvest threat there's lots you can do about distributed denial of service. You can protect that traffic from modification using these public key protocols, but there's not much you can do from the record and harvest where, you know, some point in the future where a large-scale quantum computer, uh, an adversary can then selectively decrypt what they have uh, um, recorded. Um, and so that affects all of our customers. Um, and so we don't know. We don't exactly know the security lifetime of all of our customers. Some of them tell us. Uh, we just make the assumption it's as long as you can reason about the security of our cryptographic systems. The other, you know, we are hearing from other some of our customers, especially in the CA space and the code signing space, about their needs for long-term roots of trust. So authentication happens in the moment. You know, as long as you're verifying signatures, classic signatures before there's a post-quantum uh, uh, computer, uh, you can be reasonably certain you're getting authentication. Uh, but but what, you, what you have to prepare for are what are the situations where, because you've made the decision to burn in that root of trust, or you're, you're in a manufacturing environment where you're not going to have an opportunity to update that device before a quantum computer, then, then you need to start thinking about you know, when do you burn in post-quantum uh, roots of trust? So, like if you're manufacturing an automobile, you might man manufacture it at time zero, it might sit on a lot. Uh, first owner might take that, that could be an enthusiast, live in a rural area, not have accessibility to a dealership, uh, drive that car for 15 years, 13 years before they sell it, and the person is going to, you know, whoever buys it will go to get it updated. And it, 13 years is a long time uh, for a device not to have software update. Uh, and a lot can change, like it could be required that you're using post-quantum crypto in 13 years. Uh, so we're hearing from some customers that, that this is a need that they want today. And, and part of what's causing us to hear that is some recent US government news. I'm sure a lot of you have been tracking. Uh, there was a, a national security memorandum in May of last year, uh, sort of establishing um, um, this migration project at NIST, as well as 180 days to establish requirements for inventorying all current deployed cryptographic systems. Um, subsequently, you know, NIST made their round, uh, completed their round three, made their announcements about standardization. And this uh, NSA followed up with their commercial national security algorithm suite, which is forecasting transition by 2033, um, essentially being done by 2033 and requiring PQ 
uh, at that point in time. Uh, and as early as 2025, certain applications like uh, firmware signing. Uh, and then they followed up with the memo uh, that they promised for the first national security memo uh, with the exact requirements for inventorying for, for government agencies that have high impact or high value asset systems. Uh, and then they followed with a, a piece of legislation basically outlining that procedure for, other, for all agencies, uh, federal agencies. So what have we been doing to preparing? I mean, we've been participating in the core uh, standards area, in particular uh, the NIST process with team members that are on um, Kyber, Dilithium, Bike, Psych, and Sphinx. Sad story about Psych. Um, I don't want to get into it. Uh, Etsy, uh, we're continuing to work in the Etsy uh, uh, quantum safe cryptography space. We're, we're working within the IETF. Um, you know, we had a TLS 1.2 draft. We've dropped that. We have, we're, we're participating in the 1.3 draft for post-quantum TLS. Uh, we have members active in uh, the SSH, PQ SSH draft, as well as the X509 work to add in post-quantum keys for signatures and chems, and, and similarly for, for, for QUIC. Uh, and we're also deploying it. So we've been running uh, PQ hybrid in our production system since 2019, uh, at the end of round two, I think was, maybe it was round one, and then we went to round two, and then round three, uh, uh, and we're building that into our TLS implementation. It's in our main line today. It's in our core crypto library today, uh, and it's available uh, for, for use within our production servers within the AWS crypto space, in particular, the key management service the uh, uh, AWS Certificate Manager and our Secrets Manager. Um, and we built that, like I said, into our, our core crypto libraries, and, and that stack is deployed everywhere S2N is deployed. Um, the Cypher suite is not turned on, but, but it's in our continuous uh, development pipeline and development. So it's being deployed constantly every time we redeploy our servers, whether that's S3, I don't know all the front ends that are using S2N, but, but certainly S3, probably our largest fleet, is deploying that software today. And our goal is to keep that software up to date, to keep pace with the process at NIST, to have it be continuously integrated into our software so that when it's a standard, we're ready to enable those cipher suites and turn on all the SDKs. Today, you kind of have to opt in uh, to use it on, 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 our, soft, on our software development kits. Uh, we, we were very cautious about that, make sure our customers are making conscious decisions because we know it's going to change between now and when NIST is done with their process. Uh, and we don't want customers baking in an SDK into their, their software that they're vending to their customers uh, that they can't regularly update. So, so we're not turning it on by default until we get through um, the NISP finishes their process. Um, and then we're participating in a number of uh, collaborative environments like uh, the National uh, um, Cyber Security Center of Excellence. I had to look it up just to make sure. And Waterloo's uh, Libo QS project. Um, so this is how I see AWS in a simplistic way in migration uh, and why we're working in these various spaces. So I look at all our external clients and how they're communicating to AWS. Uh, they're all kind of communicating through some uh, well-defined uh, protocol that's, that's in the public domain, like SSH or TLS or um, Direct Connect, which is using either MacSec or IPSec. Um, and then we have inside all our internal networking. Um, again, a lot, some MACSEC, some layer one encryption, VPC encryption, which is sort of fabric encryption for your virtual private cloud environment. Uh, and then we have, a, like, like most large organizations, uh, a, a number of bespoke protocols that we need to begin testing and updating. Uh, and we're in that process. And then we're going to update all our security crypto services. And, and, and kind of like that sign, that should cover a vast majority of, of migrating all our other services. But, but just like those other internal bespoke protocols, we have you know, individual engineering 
uh, work to be done in all those services. But we're starting from the outside in. Um, so I have a little disclaimer on this page that says this is not AWS's uh, um, plan. Uh, this is my personal opinion on how fast I think you could prudently move um, and, and the steps in, in doing that. Uh, so the current phase that I think we're in and we've been in for a while is inventorying of existing systems, identification and development of new standards, uh, developing those migration plans and testing them to understand if we can just migrate or do we need to do significant re-engineering. And then, you know, over the next five years, really deploying, and, and for me, you know, my focus is going to be on deploying uh, post-quantum chems in a hybrid mode to protect against long-term uh, confidentiality. Uh, being opportunistic about it now to make sure it's in our pipelines without building any legacy debt of how am I going to migrate a set of customers uh, in the future. So I'm trying to prevent that until uh, the standards are done. Uh, and that'll still take you know, five years to propagate that software. Uh, I think the deployment of new PQ long-lived routes of trust, uh, I don't think you can go, I don't think you can do it right away. I think uh, Mike highlighted some of the struggles. I have a, a little bar graph that, that highlights some of that timeline. It's fairly generic, but it's, it's looking at um, the stateful hash-based signatures and dilithium. But I think, you know, we'll see people standing up long -lived, new long-lived routes of trust uh, in the two to five year time frame. I think that's about as fast as you can go. Um, smaller, specialized, or closed systems, you might start using them. But for complex or online systems, uh, specifically online systems, I think uh, I don't see moving to the signature uh, for, for authentication until there's greater clarity on the need. Because once you have the roots and the software in place, you only need to start using them uh, before a quantum computer or when you're reasonably confident, T minus five is what I have, is what that's supposed to read. But like, when I'm confident that there'll be a large scale quantum computer within five years, uh, that I need to move. But, but until then, I just need to be prepared to move for authentication. That's different for firmware, of course. Firmware systems you might need to deploy earlier. So a timeline for stateful hash-based signatures, I mean, we have a spec NIST SP 800-208. Uh, as somebody uh, highlighted, there isn't an implementation guidance uh, to use as long as well as test vectors to get FIPS certified. Um, so once that's done, uh, you now can create a conforming implementation. Uh, there's a delay, right? The current delay for a FIPS 140-3 certificate is 570 days. Um, uh, we monitor that like everything else at Amazon, we have a dashboard, we look up every certificate as it goes through the process. And that, that's our, it's off by a day or two every so often. Uh, but um, that's the uh, current wait. So you can't really, um, you know, if you model, it's gonna take two years to get implementation guidance. And then another essentially two years to get FIPS certified. Well, that's four years and, and to stand up a route. So if, if NIST pops up their, their implementation guidance and test vectors, essentially that's still two years to be ready to stand up a route, which will get you in at 2030, 2025, just under the wire, I think. So still possible. Uh, and then you can have your root CA ceremonies. And depending on your environment, uh, how long it takes to distribute those routes. Uh, so uh, that's where we are. I've been, I've been reluctant to try to deploy a stateful hash-based system at Amazon because we run a very uh, dynamic distributed environment. The set of HSMs that our customers use or that we use to run our service is dynamic. Sometimes there's one, sometimes there's a thousand. Uh, and uh, it's, it's easy to split up uh, a stateful hash-based signature keys across a static fleet. Uh, I think that's well known. But when it's dynamic, uh, that becomes very problematic. Uh, as well as, you know, our, our, how we're going to handle disaster recovery. Uh, so I always want to know from, from people, how urgent are your stateful hash base needs? Because that will, you know, influence how, how much 
uh, em emphasis we have to put on developing that now versus can we wait for uh, dilithium. Um, okay, then I have a set of references. I think they'll distribute these slides, and, and, and that's all I have. So thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, that was a uh, great presentation. And let's check the time. We do have a few minutes uh, before we starting the uh, the panel discussion. So, are there any questions from the room? Maybe remote. I think you had a very clear presentation, but we have two questions remote. Okay, Constantine asks, can you give any insight into whether a disaster like ETS, formerly ETLS, could happen again with PQC? Uh, what, what's the, I guess I'm not tracking the disaster on ETLS. I'm not sure when it, when it was. Um, Maybe we can try to I'll, follow up later okay, on the yep. chat. Um, I'll ask Constantine to follow up later. Okay. Was there another question? So the other question, uh, Juan is asking, is it, is it expected to hear in the near future about an update to Etsy TS 119.312, where, where it is recommended to migrate from RSA to RSA PSS or ECDSA for 2025? Uh, I'm not tracking, is that, um, uh, we are, it sounds like that might be from ESI. Uh, but and that's the electronic signatures and infrastructure technical committee. But I'm not familiar with that specification. Uh, but um, those are the type of things that I think you know the QSC technical uh, committee uh, is going to deal with. It typically gets enacted through a liaison statement. So like somebody in who's a member of that standards organization, that working group would contact QSC and ask for guidance. And then we'd probably contribute to that. Actually, I think we have scheduled a meeting with Etsy ESI and TC Cyber on the post quantum topic. Um, I think next week or in a couple of weeks. So uh, maybe we have some news by then. Might have news by then. Okay. Any questions from the room? Hey, Matt. Um, I'm going to check first here. One, two. Uh, I haven't heard anything, Matt, about the quantum transition, about digital signature, and there's a topic out there having to do with hash, then sign versus just sign, and the impact that this, this is going to have, especially if you work in hybrids and so on. Is anyone in Etsy and in the standards that you were showing, especially with uh, SIM cards and tiny devices, is anyone looking at those two, that the debate, I guess, mm. and is there anything going on there? Um, uh, th there's nothing, that, that topic hasn't come up in QSC. Okay. I mean, we, we are looking at adopting, you know, and, and sort of what comes out of the NIST process uh, is, is where our focus is when it comes to adopting, you know, a standard like dilithium. So no one has... A so it hasn't come up. Uh, yeah. Thanks. So if there are no further remaining questions, I think it is a good time to start with our panel discussion.